Hi, uh, hope you had a nice tea break. Uh, the, the talks today have been excellent and I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I'm, mine is like half as good as what we have witnessed, the last two talks especially. Uh, I'm going to talk about something very, very uh, uh, useful, I think, but in a, in a manner which is uh, supposed to be very approachable, okay. So the idea is not to really enumerate tools or get into like, you know, what is the way, the how to of you, you know, you can do secrets management in the cloud. I will kind of give you uh, a way to think about it, so then it doesn't really matter, right? If which how do you pick up, which tool you are uh, used to, and uh, you know what are the important things is what we'll do. Uh, I did a version of this talk at an online conference recently, uh, All Day DevOps, uh, and the main reason to do the talk like this was uh, the main motivation was that uh, there is just you know an explosion of tools and, and approaches and you know whatever these buzzwords are, right? And uh, as part of my job, uh, I do a lot of application security stuff around uh, cloud security stuff. I at least need to know what the, these keyword, keywords are. So I started feeling, uh, you know, that, that I'm, I'm missing out on things. I don't understand what this whole world is, okay? Some people call it FOMO, fear of missing out. And uh, what I'm going to cover is not really a new idea at, by any stretch, but let's see. Just a little about me, why you should listen to me. Uh, I am uh, uh, co-founder, director of a company, AppSeco. We are a specialist application security company. Uh, I've written uh, one book which got published a couple of years ago. I'm writing another one on uh, security automation with Ansible. Some of you may be familiar with that. And again, Ansible is not the primary thing there, right? Uh, uh, use cases and approaches of security automation is the primary thing, okay? Uh, I'm part of communities like Null, I'm one of the co-founders, uh, which incidentally started in Pune. Uh, now it's a global uh, thing in 13 or 14 cities across the world. I was also part of the OWASP Bangalore chapter for a long time, but uh, due to my other commitments, I've kind of, uh, you know, taken a back seat there. Oh, I have like these things. <laughs> so this is a personal journey. Uh, you know, there are enough number of medium posts, blog posts, videos, conferences, which will tell you how do you get started doing, uh, you know, all kinds of orchestration, provisioning, security, scaling, whatever the keyword is, right? You can do all of that uh, online, right? There is just not enough, uh, you know, there's just not enough time, there's enough content, right? And uh, you could be talking about, I want to store secrets in a way which are like highly available, like uh, the primary store can go down, but it's still available. There is like reduced service, but it's available. Maybe it wants automated uh, service discovery, which you can do with these clusters, right? But how about we have a discussion here, okay? How about we try and understand what are these secrets? What are we ultimately trying to protect? And when you have a better idea of that, right? What is the easy way? What is the iterative way, the step-by-step -step way of going forward? Okay, I'm nowhere uh, an expert in distributed computing or, you know, the kinds of experts that we've heard today. So, uh, feel free to stop me and, you know, uh, correct me if I'm uh, wrong somewhere. What I'll try and do, that by the end of the talk, you have some idea that there is a step-by-step -step way of assurance. Obviously, what you're not doing is that you're secure in the next 45 minutes. Right? But you have a way, a way forward. And uh, because it's a step-by-step -step way at every step, you can try and figure out, hey, this doesn't really suit me or this doesn't make sense. Right? So let me course correct or let me do uh, my own thing. And uh, one of the most important things is it should not be complicated. Right? There is enough complication as soon as you start talking about multiple well, microservices. There are different uh, services talking to each other. Everything has a log. A all the logs need to go somewhere, right? And, and it just gets complicated really quickly, right? So uh, I like the Docker approach where the tooling makes it simple for you to embrace a new way of thinking about doing things, right? In the end, what do we want? We want it to. We, we want to be productive in the stuff that we want to do, right? And if we can be productive, then we are effective. Right? And if you are effective, then we can solve the business problems that we care about, right? or any other problem. So why am I talking about secrets and why are we talking about secrets right now? The 
personal journey, right? So, uh, for me, you know, we are a small specialist AppSec company, but we uh, uh, value being cloud first. Uh, we really believe in dog fooding, so I was happy to see that slide today. Uh, uh, we believe that the tools and the, you know, the services and the products that our clients are using and we are uh, helping them secure those are the things we should be using, right? Either we build some things, we reuse open source, whatever it is, right? And uh, uh, we have to be aware, there are many, many ways of managing secrets. People have been doing it for a long time. So there was always, you know, uh, various ways of doing it. Maybe it was not fully automated. Maybe there was like a people process more than a technology process, but we need to be aware. And uh, if the software is, uh, you know, uh, keeping them safe, then we're actually se uh, secure, right? If the software works, then uh, other things are possible. And we do, uh, the two of us, there's another person, Madhu and me, uh, we basically do the IT ops in the company and we have deployed uh, production workloads. We have a couple of clusters running and uh, uh, the staging part and the production and, you know, we, we worry about it because we are a security company, right? Even before we worry about performance, even before we worry about uptime, even before we worry about scale, we worry about as soon as we deploy this, what, what will happen, right? From a security point of view. That's something we can't really uh, not think about. And uh, we want to basically say that, you know, that other devs, the tech uh, folks in our company, for us tech means that these guys are doing uh, application assessments, pen testing and stuff. Sometimes they need to have tools ready in a place which can connect to the client system. And uh, then now, now we're talking about client data, sensitive client data because we are scanning, we are doing security testing, right? How do we manage all this? Right? So that's where we started thinking about secrets. And what were we trying to protect? We basically have a very typical uh, small company production and staging requirement. We m run multiple applications. Uh, we do, uh, you know, these applications have auth authentication built in, right? The code is written for authentication. We run uh, uh, sites where the authentication authorization is a middleware. Right, uh, with some kind of a OAuth uh, uh, kind of integration, and uh, we typically use Nginx where where the SSL TLS ends. Right, so once you're on the server, that's where the uh, SSL connection will end, and then uh, proxy will happen to reverse uh, proxy will happen, and we use let, Let's Encrypt. We don't really try to uh, keep it too complicated. It's cheap and easy for us, automated, and uh, we have our single sign-on provider. So obviously. Whenever we need to, we don't want to put something, uh, you know, behind uh, HTTP basic authentication. So we, we we do this, right? So typical workload, uh, a lot of companies will understand, or in, at least in a larger company, some projects tend to have this kind of workload. So I had to do this uh, with my colleague, and uh, we were like, okay, where do we start? So uh, we know how to install and configure software. Right? That's something we have learned since we started using computers. So we were like, okay, let's install some software. So uh, we went ahead and uh, looked at what's available. There was something called uh, an open source software called HashiCorp Vault. And uh, the documentation seemed easy enough to start with. And it had a UI, right? The UI is important because not everyone is, uh, you know, comfortable and familiar with the Linux command line, right? You, you, you can aspire that everyone should be, but it doesn't really happen. So, you know, you want UI. And uh, we were like, we installed it, very, very simple to install. I think it's like a 10 minute install if you really think about it. We set it up on a, a cloud server uh, and we hardened it the way we, we do. And then we whitelisted the IP addresses, uh, you know, which could connect to it. So we were good. And uh, what else did we do with that? We did a local install and then uh, there was a Vagrant install available by the uh, uh, creators. So that was good enough to change the provider from VirtualBox to our cloud provider and it got deployed, right? So we were in business. We didn't really have to think any more about the, the, the infrastructure here, the, the plumbing, right? And uh, what did we like about Vault, right? It turned out to be a very, very decent solution. If you are uh, going to talk to me about, uh, just one sec, sorry, I need to. I can't read my uh, notes, they're too small right now. Okay. 
world is a go binary right there is no package dependency to worry about we just had to download it which means that our script can download it you put it in path and it's good right don't have to worry about it don't have to think about it right and the configuration is as simple as this this is a configuration where the secrets will get stored in a local file okay in a path which is whatever and it is listening we are doing a tcp listener on the random uh, default port that it uses 8200 and for our use because vault will never be exposed outside right it's only the internal apps which will be looking at it we were like you know what let's not do tls for now we secure the server because if anyone is already on the server we have bigger problems to uh, deal with okay and you just save it in a file and this is this starts the server right so this is the server part the same command is uh, can be used for the client and uh, it already has a bare minimum role based access which means that if i generate the the default token i generate so that i can uh, interact with vault through an uh, you know a rest based api that gives me root access like a root of the vault uh, server and if i generate another token and say that hey you will only have access to secrets under a folder called secrets right then if i create a folder called appseco uh, this other token will not have access so it's already doing some basic uh, role based access and i'm not really interested in more right now right we're a small team we want to keep it simple uh but it has this concept of plugins and uh, transport mechanisms where you can you know uh, uh, plug it with your ldap or uh, uh, some kind of uh, other saml provider we were not interested but we could have done that if we need to right the interesting part is vault has to be sealed and unsealed okay which means that once you initialize the server something has to happen on the vault okay this people have created uh, nice automation around this but uh, according to the best practices of hashicorp vault you should not do this 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 part should be manual okay this is i will tell you why uh, they uh, talk about it if you want to just follow the instructions uh, of installing this till till this much uh, there is a link i tweeted that as well so uh, you'll have it in the uh, twitter hashtag so consider this was our reference architecture there is a vault ui which is a uh, it's actually a you know uh, one of these uh, javascript front end apps view so that's running on my laptop right it requires node and bunch of things which have to be installed and that's the client over the internet it reaches some server which is uh, uh, nginx as the you know front uh, tls single sign on and behind that vault with the storage on file system okay so this is my first uh, point where i'm a little scared that oh what happens if the server's file system crashes right i don't have a backup right now okay so obviously once i say that i'm storing all my secrets here and the secrets are gone it's a problem right and this is the server but at this point if i was thinking of hey i have a you know production workload in uh, uh, one of the cloud providers and uh, secrets were required i could just go with this setup right at this point i don't really care about uh, uh, having you know uh, the the secrets being copied in a uh, distributed fashion i update one node and you know it gets copied to the other places which uh, uh, the the other product of hashicorp console can do right and and service discovery all of that is like already decided i don't i'm not saying that the entire cluster has to come up on its own i am saying i am in the configuration defining this is where the secrets are going to be kept which is fine but how do i bootstrap the secrets if i am doing this once in the entire lifespan of the company i am done right but typically that's not what we'll do right in the in the age in the the discussion about uh, devops devsecops or whatever the keyword that we want to use we want to think of hey how can i put this in some kind of a configuration right which can be under version control and you know all that cool things that happen around that so where do we store the keys that are generated when we unseal the vault this is what the command looks like you do a init and uh, these five keys got generated and they have to be stored somewhere what hashicorp vault says that 
distribute these keys securely out of band. Maybe you know send a uh, signal message or uh, encrypted email message to five different people so that if ever this has to be unsealed again, right, you require more than one person to do that. Okay, this is kind of like how uh, if you're familiar with the uh, have you ever seen like a bad uh, movie where they talk about nuclear bombs and whatever and to start the bomb you have two people have to put in the key, right? It's the same concept, right? It's actually a, a computer science concept I, I can't remember right now, but whatever. Ideally, these keys are not meant to be part of the automation, but obviously uh, smart people are smart. Uh, people figured out that, hey, they, we want to deploy a vault. Uh, but in AWS, AWS has uh, a key management service, right? Obviously, Azure has something, uh, GCP has something. So we will do something which will generate the key. It is already stored securely in uh, KMS, right? And uh, it will unseal the world. Because eventually, what is happening? A request is being made. Right? The entire way this application is a, a, a kind of a get request is being made. So the, it can uh, you know, get stored in the environment, it can come from KMS or whatever it is that people want to do. The advantages of uh, something like AWS uh, KMS is that you can trust Amazon with the master key or you can tell Amazon that hey you know what I don't trust you, I mean you are using the infrastructure but whatever, I will provide my keys. Right? It could be a compliance thing or whatever it is that you are trying to do. But we are not doing that right now. We are just answering the question, where would you store this? Right? The first big question, and uh, like a, I don't have an answer, but what do I do with this? Because then it, does it uh, pass the uh, uh, bus test, under the bus test? Are you familiar with that? If there are five keys required to unseal the vault, and one of the people who holds the key, authorized people, comes under a bus. Right? And all uh, where they had stored the key was in their head, then the vault is not going to unseal. Okay? Some uh, interesting things to think about. So, what are these secrets that we should worry about? I have parked that question aside. That I don't have an answer for. The unsealed keys have to be stored somewhere. I don't have an answer where. Okay? Let me park that question. I have to move forward. I have to be productive. Remember? I want to use vault for something. Okay? So what are these secrets I should store? Then I started making a list. Certificates. Makes sense. Right? I, there are certificates I use to sign other certificates. Definitely should go there. Uh, SSH keys. Maybe these keys are required when I deploy stuff. So I don't want them to be on uh, you know, ops, laptops or some server randomly. What else do I have? API tokens. Makes sense. Passwords. Very, very standard uh, use case for all of us. Is there anything else we can store? So we thought, why not store the QR code when we generate 2FA enrollments? Right? Either the uh, initial key or the uh, uh, QR code. Why? Because uh, there are two people in ops. There are some websites which will uh, allow us to do two-factor two authentication. Right? But if it's in my phone and I lose my phone, it's gone. Right? But if I store that screenshot of the QR code somewhere, just like that, it can get lost or it can get stolen. So maybe I'll store that. Audit logs. Remember, it's on the file system. I, at this point, I don't really care about uh, the cost of storage. Right? Any, uh, I mean, storage is really cheap at this point anyway. So uh, uh, why not store some audit logs which may have sensitive details? Okay, so uh, uh, we have a, a particular site where we do store the entire uh, post request of a certain action. And what we didn't want to do was mask some of the sensitive information. So either we store it and you know trust that whatever centralized storage that we have, logging storage we have, uh, we take care of it there, or we were like, why don't we store that in the vault? Made sense. Uh, again, similar to the uh, QR codes, uh, the time-based uh, 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 OTB uh, generation keys, uh, like when you do with uh, MFA with AWS, you can store that. The questions I still had, I had many. Is this the best way to manage secrets? 
my big problem with a lot of uh, online content which I end up reading about uh, you know distributed computing and how people are managing to automate everything about uh, infrastructure and all right sometimes they tend to skip these things about security or they already have the overall culture right where people understand their responsibilities and they will not commit secrets to their public github whatever right you understand right so we have to uh, uh, so my question was is this the best way should i be using which is uh, something which is cloud specific uh, there is this uh, person on twitter uh, i think her name is chris nova uh, she recently wrote a book called cloud native it's like a free uh, 20 30 page book and uh, she has a very interesting quote in that book where she says that you know every time you worry about being uh, 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 like getting locked in like cloud vendor lock in you need to understand that you are, your thought process also locks you into a certain way okay so maybe you can be pragmatic about it but whatever because if i was doing aws or gcp then i might as well use their way of doing secrets right because they will have the best guidance maybe how resilient is this i know it's just the one service on one server so not a lot but at this point i was okay with it how will i be able to automate to make this reproducible i'm not trying to solve this question but i still have it right it's it's it, it worries me and uh, uh, that's one of the main things about uh, when you start thinking about security and assurance right there are some things that you cannot enforce because team productivity will take a nose dive but that does not mean you will not worry about these things has anyone else experienced that can't be alone in this right nobody well okay you all are very secure what else uh, they were like those things kept me up and then there were these other fears right like even worse what if i made some mistake and you know this will leak the data ever felt like that no wow okay <laughs> what if my backups fail okay i'll come back to these fears and uh, doubts a little later but uh, that was a big big uh, someone must have done backup and restore in this room right no D did you never worry about that oh well ah uh, okay <laughs> i see what you did there so now i was doing ops okay and uh, small team so i have to play multiple roles so i had to like think of what are the security angles here if i was consulting with a client who had come to me with these questions what would i say to them right because that was the way to think about this well start with don't panic take a step back because we have to think of abstractions we can't really deal with the details at this point right we 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 have not framed the problem yet there are some fears and doubts but we haven't framed the problem yet right so concepts that helped me in you know these abstractions were something called a plain text key i'll explain what that is secure storage that's simple enough to understand some storage which is secure or at least we think it is secure at this point okay secure access once you have secure storage it implies that there is a secure way of access right at the very least there will be authentication authorization right a good uh, solution will also mean that uh, uh, the you know the transport will be uh, uh, not in plain text it will be like authenticated encrypted which is tls for us and uh, ability to choose which user sees which secret even though i didn't really work a lot on this at this point but i was like okay i have to think about that at some point otherwise it will not be productive it will not be you know production worthy it will just be a, a poc right this was an interesting one because i started reading and i realized that oh if a secret loses its meaning do i really care about it okay and there are projects like that before we uh, proceed and do more of this just this a little bit about digital secrets okay some attributes that help me remembering you know that 
if a digital secret is stolen, we still have our copy. Right? There is nothing you can do about it. It looks exactly the same. There is no change. Which means, the best way to store something that is important is in a form which is encrypted and not in plain text. Do we all agree? It should be encrypted. But, if we encrypt something, there exists a key which has to be plain text. Right? So, this plain text key needs to be protected. Okay? And it's a, it's a known problem. It's, it, I think uh, the, the, the uh, subject of distributed computing is from the 60s or the 70s, right? And people have understood this being a problem since then. Okay? There are various ways of solving it, but that's fine. The plain text key should have secure storage. And we should be able to prove that we are authorized to access it when we want it. Secure access. So we can't encrypt this. Right? That's clear. Because we need it, right? But if it has secure storage, if we can, you know, do something about storage which is secure, and if we can do something about secure access, we are making progress, right? We can be productive. Our plain text key, I'm really sorry, I have to look at the screen because I can't read the font here. You did something. <laughs> the text is like too small. Uh, so, it can be stored inside a vault behind keys which are with multiple people. That's the HashiCorp vault way of doing it, right? KMS is a different way of doing it. Uh, uh, the way uh, GCP uh, thinks of encryption is a different way or whatever, digital secrets. We have shifted the burden of security from tech to a people process because we are not saying how you will keep the uh, vault unsealed key safe, the one that you have. But even if one of them is leaked, it's okay. Make sense? But at the same time, it's not a technology that's solving uh, it for us. There is a really nice uh, uh, talk given by uh, someone called Daniel Somerfield. It happened, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called Turtles All the Way Down. Right, where he basically describes that you can, uh, you know, take the plain text key and encrypt it and encrypt it, and you still at some point will end up with something which is plain text. Right, that's how it is. So you can't solve it there. You can try it. People have uh, uh, given solutions to that, but it doesn't work. Uh, like one of the big problems in you know blockchain or anything distributed, where you want to like uh, accept what you are seeing is the truth. Right? The, the problem is which is the source of truth? Because you are saying nothing is master and slave, but they are all same peers, right? So there is a lot of work happening in like these consensus algorithms and whatever, right? Uh, uh, Paxos and Raft and whatever. So secrets as plain text keys will be stored in a file system and if they are read in memory, right? That's a problem. It's a problem if it's a multi-user system. Right? And if it's a problem if the memory is not secure. If you are orchestrating servers and provisioning applications, the plain text key may be copied somewhere closer. Right? It may be cached. Like uh, uh, we, when we do a lot of uh, pen testing engagements, what happens is eventually we end up find, uh, you know, finding a way to execute code on a, a web server, but we are not root yet. Okay? We are just a regular web server user, maybe WW data or something. But uh, with, with a lot of servers, what most people forget is that the uh, home directory permissions, the slash home uh, directory permissions tend to be uh, world readable, right? And world uh, uh, executable, which means I can read what are the directories under slash home and I can chdir into them, right? And if there is like an admins uh, home directory, because people want to be, you know, all uh, organized. So they do stuff in their home directory. And they're using things like uh, the MySQL client or the Postgres client. Sometimes for orchestration or, you know, uh, logging into the servers, the database servers, they have provided the key as part of the command line. Right? And that's in some kind of a dot file, which is world readable. Right? So, uh, some things can happen. So what I'm trying to say is that it can be in memory or it could be, you know, cached. That's the problem. Uh, like
like uh, you could have a Linux server with a disk volume which is encrypted. You're using uh, uh, standard encryption, not the full disk encryption, just the metadata is uh, available, but the data is actually encrypted, like NKFS. If you have to mount it, you have to provide the plain text key. Now this could be a proper production workload, right? As a security person, I can't say that you can't use this because it's a genuine uh, use case for many people. So then the key has to exist somewhere close to the server or it has to be copied to the server at some point, right? So this is a problem that we have to think about. Another example is if we are automating something like Jenkins, uh, a CI, CD security uh, automation tool basically. And we need to, you know, configure when we've installed it, right? The admin password is in a predictable path. By default it is, ideally you should change it, but you may or may not. For us to run our commands, let's say I want to use the Jenkins CLI because I want to configure the Jenkins to do some things before someone logs in, right? Uh, again, this password will either get copied to a, a file which only the root can read or the secure user can, re authorized user can read, or it will be in a predictable path. These are some of the things that happen currently, right? That is how we deal with plain text keys typically, right? Again, you will not agree, right? None of you ever copied a password to the server, ever. Either you guys have never worked on servers or whatever. Cloud for this discussion is someone else's computer, okay? We are trusting that computer. It's CPU, it's disk, it's memory. Typically that's what allows you to get started. Maybe not uh, do data science really well, but you can get started. Still with our abstractions, if the CPU, disk and memory belong to someone else's computer, there's nothing you can do to keep it a secret, right? Another good example is a mobile app with credentials hard coded in the app. The CPU, disk and memory belongs to the owner of the phone. If they choose to, they can try to read your hard coded credentials or the secret in many, many different ways, right? So we just have to be aware of this, not saying we use this, not use it, but we have to be aware of this. The question is, can you trust the security procedures and whatever policies of companies like AWS, GCP, Azure? The interesting thing is uh, almost three to four years ago, till three to four years ago, a lot of people used to say that, no, 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 we have to do this, this hybrid cloud or this uh, in-house cloud, you know, things like eucalyptus and stuff, right? People really believe that they could be more secure than these, right? And maybe for some workloads, it's just not acceptable to send it there. But uh, I'm guessing most of us in this room for this conference are okay with this, yes? No? Maybe? <laughs> okay, cool. I'll take that. So, what exactly can I find on AWS Azure GCP for secrets management? AWS has things like Cloud HSM, okay, which is like a hardware security module. So, uh, I've never seen one. I would like to believe that there's like a command that you give to some kind of a robotic arm which like unlocks the actual hardware and you do things. Because an HSM is supposed to uh, be like an enclosed thing, right? One of the attributes of an HSM is that if someone tries to break into it, right? Whatever secrets it holds inside will be destroyed. That is the assurance the HSM will give you, right? And obviously it's supposed to be read only at, at, at uh, you know, as far as the main master key is concerned or whatever, right? So AWS offers a service, it's quite expensive but it's there. Their main service which a lot of people use is the KMS, uh, which I think is a fantastic service. Uh, we, even without trying to get into like, pro, you know, supplying your own keys, uh, it does a, a decent job. And uh, they had a, a very nice blog post last year on, a, on how they generate randomness uh, when they have to generate new tokens and all. It's like uh, fantastic. So uh, you store the master key in KMS and then you use it to encrypt and decrypt secret stuff. They have something called parameter store, which is, uh, uh, you know, it can store strings. So obviously it can store, uh, uh, you know, uh, strings which are secure because they were encrypted with KMS. And wherever you need it, at that point you do an API call to the KMS to decrypt and you use the string. There's a fabulous talk by Ivan Johnson. 
of secrets management in the cloud. Uh, you should watch it. He talks about uh, he's, he had his, his uh, workload was to use it for AWS ECS, the container service. So he had to use the parameter store there. Was that a bell? Okay. So Azure has Key Vault. So consider that it does all the three things that uh, AWS does, but it's basically called Key Vault and the API is simpler. GCP has cloud key management service and you can generate, rotate and destroy encryption keys. They all have some common features. All of them provide a straightforward way to uh, store the plain text key, right? Because we are still solving that problem of the plain text key. They are API driven, right? When I say API driven, they are HTTP API driven, right? Which means that you want to, you can use a client in your programming language to uh, make the request or you could do just, just do a curl. Right, because it's part of your uh, initial cloud in it or something. Right, it could be anything. And typically, they are integrated with the IAM. You solve the role-based access management thing right there. Right, right, and you get audits. Uh, you get logs for audits, which is especially useful once you start using it. You can use the keys managed by them, or you can do that BYOK, which is always funny. Right, bring your own key. One of the things that I loved is the uh, way GCP does when you connect using the uh, browser to a cloud instance, a VM instance, right? It actually generates a new key. This is not connecting through SSH. You are using the browser and you know, say connect to this machine, right? Or you use the G Cloud SDK, right? The command line thing. It will generate a new SSH key. It will uh, copy the relevant parts to the, uh, you know, it's a key pair. So one part of that is copied to the server and uh, you have the private key and uh, the connection happens. Once you're done, you exit, the command has come out, right? Uh, it's done, it uh, removes it, right? Another really interesting uh, approach is uh, how Netflix uses uh, short-lived uh, keys, right? The keys are uh, signed by their uh, certificate authority and after some time those keys are revoked, right? So you have stopped worrying about my SSH key getting stolen, which is a problem even when you uh, talk about any CI, CD online, right? Unless and until you're doing an agent based thing, which is a different problem altogether. So what are the tools available to you? Most of the tools act like Unix utilities, right? Uh, there's a tool like Confident and uh, uh, Chamber, all these apart from vault which will allow you to do all this. You can choose to store root creds of AWS accounts in KeePass and you know can share them over Dropbox, that's a tool available. You can allow to, it allows you to revoke credentials of admin users. You may use the KMS, you can use the KMS like a cloud HSM, it's not exactly that but if your threat model is such you don't really care. If you're running a SaaS you may want to use tenant admins password as a salt right to encrypt the key provided by the cloud provider right and then uh, offload the process so azure uh, kind of recommends this if you are uh, deploying uh, uh, using their key vault they're like use the user's password so that even though there is a master key right every uh, uh, way the encryption happens is different and uh, uh, they manage you have to obviously manage if the password changes you know the key has to be rotated but that's something you can do the fears and doubts that I have, I still have some of them. Is this the best way to manage secrets, the vault way? I would say smart people have done the thinking. You know, you just choose one of the patterns and go with and uh, uh, see what else can go wrong. Should I be doing something cloud specific? If I had stuff in multiple clouds, I would want to go with vault, which I do, right? Because uh, I want to be aware of all the other uh, infra things possible. If you are a single cloud, I would just say go with the cloud provider and review later, right? When you are like, I need a multi-cloud strategy, which is the buzzword of 2017, right? If you want resilience, uh, maybe you want to like print out the unsealed keys and put them in a physical safe, because that's what uh, people do with the uh, GPG keys, right? GPG master keys. So that's like a known pattern. It's been there forever. If you go to the GPG page, uh, web page, it still lists out how you should uh, secure your master keys. You have to put it in a physical uh, safe and ideally it should be fire resistant, right? You're not only worried about uh, actual thieves, but you know, disasters. How will I be able to automate this? The concepts are same, abstractions are same. You'll have to figure out the approach, but the key is 
not this the other key, but the main factor is it's a HTTP API driven. So if you are like you know devs should not be very complicated for you to figure out. You may not be able to figure out this approach on day one, but in iterations, right? You can get started. Uh, well, <laughs> ideally, if your backups fail and you worry about it, uh, restore testing restore should be like a part of your uh, IT security hygiene. But that's the way forward. If you do plan to store secrets in the cloud, I would say storage security, access security, automation possibilities, cooking required, and compliance. For all these five uh, factors, it is very, very rare that you will find a company which will do better than those three, right? But uh, your choice. Uh, these are some of the things that you will get in the references. My final slide. If you are new to this approach, let's say you are thinking about secrets management and you've not started, you know, I would say think of two processes, one for humans, one for systems. Right, like how uh, Google GCP has IAM and uh, the system accounts, right? And uh, try to go from easy to hard rather than trying to uh, do the most difficult part first. I have uh, seen in my personal experience, uh, uh, engineers tend to want to tackle the hardest things first, right? It may work uh, at an individual level, but for teams, not always. So humans, the easiest is set up, uh, set up shared key pass databases, sync with each other set up a vault server, right? Because those keys, unsealed keys have to be managed. Put them behind Nginx, create the entries for SSH and passwords. Use a, pro a provider which can match company directory. You know, this will make it easy to revoke access, right? The way you do it, maybe you use LDAP or uh, if you're a very small team, just give uh, uh, employee ID as the folder and whatever keys they want to store and they have the token to read and write to that. Right. For systems, use the same cloud provider where the servers are hosted, and if possible, deploy serverless apps which expose secrets from the cloud KMS. Right. It's a very, very simple pattern, and uh, it's not a lot uh, of cost. But there have been cases where serverless has leaked data, especially Lambda. Right. Up to like four minutes after the initial uh, this thing. So your mileage may vary. Uh, that's it. That I'm done. Sorry for rambling a bit, but I have two minutes for questions and feedback. Did I speak too quickly? Was it huh? So I'm just going to assume that the talk was so brilliant, there were no questions. Oh, you have a question. Um, authentication as such itself is uh, individual dependent, right? He has to remember the password and make sure, and you are kind of passing on the trust that the person won't share the password or write it down and some it won't leak somewhere else, right? But nowadays there are some uh, solutions that are not password based authentication but behavior based. Uh, like Unify ID, I'm not sure if you have heard about it. They debuted in last year TechCrunch, Tech Crunch, I'm not sure where they are right now. But seems like a good solution like they monitor walking patterns, their heartbeats, whatever the data is available, they use 2730 data points. Uh, in order to detect who the person is, make sure that there is a person who's trying to log in or whatever it is. So how do you think uh, that would scale to a cloud level or do you think that has value to add and what is the, what are the problems, different problems in terms of security that, that can happen uh, in those cases? Uh, I'm not really familiar with uh, Unify ID, but uh, uh, basically for, for me as an attacker, when I think of uh, myself as an attacker, uh, authentication boils down to some token that the system uh, accepts, right? And uh, most of the attacks tend to be about uh, finding that token and misusing it, right? So more than people forgetting, uh, the worry is uh, can someone else or something else spoof the token, right? So uh, that is not really a solved problem. Even biometrics don't really solve that, right? Uh, pattern matching is uh, always very useful, but it is always uh, dependent on the threat model. When you label systems as non-critical or you know something as uh, uh, business focused P1, P2, whatever, and some things are critical, automatically the way access happens and authentication happens changes. Okay, so let me give you a good example. Uh, the backup certificates for the controller of uh, certification authority of India are in Bangalore. They are in a uh, uh, 
uh, government of India CDAC uh, location that they are housed in this bunker which is like 5 feet of concrete right the uh, the walls are like 5 feet thick and when you enter that uh, there is like a 30 40 kg iron metal door right two people are required to like open the door you enter and only one person gets to go into the jail right inside that jail is where the uh, uh, hsm is right so there is a risk that if the people the two people who are in, inside don't uh, follow process there will be an automatic lockdown right so it can be that or it can be like where people are just saying hey you know what uh, the password is in the excel sheet which is on uh, i've shared over google drive <laughs> right but for uh, systems authentication boils down to a token that token can have many forms but eventually that token is as good as anything someone is uh, knows or someone uh, is supposed to have any factor of authentication boils down to the token right which is why now there is uh, like aws has this thing called sts the the uh, the tokens which expire within an hour or something right and they do this uh, role delegation of for systems where the idea is that the central authority is saying that if i give you a token it's only valid for this much time right but uh, what people don't realize is as soon as you start talking about time and expiry then you better have all your systems you know talking to a secure ntp server i'm sorry did i answer your question or i went on a tangent <laughs> does someone have a better answer i'm really sorry i I will add that link. Uh, it's on the AWS security blog, but I will uh, uh, I'll add the link. But any okay. But suppose I just need to search for it. Then what would you recommend? I mean, in terms of keywords. So there, uh, it's about uh, random number generation, the, the that thing. But uh, they're doing some crazy uh, atmospheric whatever whatever to get the initial seed. Okay. I yeah. I think so. <laughs> I think I'm done. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Akash.